Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Okay, so welcome. This is Todd Tasky with the Second Bite Podcast. I am uh, happy to have with me today Jeremy Weiss, CEO of Rise 25, who has done thousands, at least hundreds of interviews with successful entrepreneurs. So we're super happy to have Jeremy on the show today. Jeremy, glad to have you. I'm excited. I've done hundreds yeah. this week, Todd. Yeah, but, you probably um, have. I, I, know you, <laughs> I know you do this constantly. I'm, ex- I'm excited about this because, you know, you talk to some of the top people surrounding kind of the agency ecosystem, because that's what you do. I'm going to tell people a little bit what you do in a second, but we're going to talk about earnout today which is a popular topic, uh, especially among agencies and anyone buying and selling the business. Also, we're going to talk about order, the order in which you are purchased, uh, especially in, you know, when we're talking about private equity. Um, and before we get into this episode, it's brought to you by Potomac Business Capital, where I know you help businesses maximize their value and specifically agencies. And you have a unique twist on the typical banking process. You create this you know, I call you um, kind of a broker slash investment banker strategy all wrapped into a ball. And you've been doing this for over 15 years and you employ the strategies of M&A, advising, exit playing, all these things. So if you've thought about at some point, you're going to probably want to sell your company. Okay. So I encourage people to engage with Todd early and uh, you can go to potomacbusinesscapital.com, email todd at potomacbusinesscapital.com. And before we get into earnout, there's another person we want to mention, your friends over at Trivest. And talk about are what you, Trivest do. Right. Are you familiar with Trivest, Jeremy? Um, a little bit, but yeah, they're, not they're as familiar. They're pretty well known. Well. Yeah, they're a well-known private equity group. They've been in business for 40 years. They're always on the list of founder-friendly funds. Um, they've done over 300 transactions over the last 40 years. They've got a process that they call their 3x process. That when they acquire a business, they look to you know triple the value of that business. Uh, they're based in Miami. They have three funds, and this is the part that's interesting. So they've got a 600 million dollar uh, fund, which is their core, and they're focused on family-owned businesses and founder-owned businesses. But then they also have about a $225 million non-control fund, which is really exciting because a lot of times entrepreneurs want to take money off the table, but they don't necessarily want to give up control of the business. And again, you still get full access to the support from Trivest, but you maintain control of the business. And the one that we get involved with a lot, they have a discovery fund, they call it. It's over $200 million. They focus on funds in the... uh, Companies in the one to four million dollar EBITDA uh, space, you know, size that want to be a platform. And so, if you hit their criteria, which I'd be happy to talk to people about, if you hit the criteria, then you get full access to full support of uh, of Trivest. So, I'm happy to have those guys as a, as a host. Happy and honored. You can check them out. Anyone listening at Trivest.com/slash Second Bite, and then there's some resources on there. We had a guest on a few episodes ago from The Great Game of Business. Trivest has partnered with them to give out uh, the latest audio book there. And, uh, I and love so, that book. Yeah, it's, it's great. So Trivest.com slash Second Bite. I want to talk about, before we get to Earnout, you, you mentioned criteria because everyone's wondering, what's the criteria? And also, how do you work with you know, Trivest and some of these other groups? So how does it work um, when someone kind of says, uh, Todd, I'm looking to sell. Yeah, so number one is, so in most of these trophies behind me, our clients get all of their earn out, whether it's in equity or cash or whatever it might be. And they get that because we have a really good fit from a business perspective up front. And that's what makes a deal really work. So we always start by trying to understand from our client, what do you want to accomplish? Right? We're going to talk about order in a minute, right? in terms of when you're acquired by private equity. You can be acquired by private equity, and that private equity portfolio company could exit next year. They could exit in five years. And if they exit in five years, maybe there's much bigger upside for you 
maybe you don't care about bigger upside. You want to get out earlier. You have bigger things to get onto or whatever the case may be. Right. So, so making a deal successful and finding the right private equity partner, if that winds up being your acquirer, is, is based on knowing the landscape pretty well and then understanding what the entrepreneur wants to accomplish. And then from uh, Trivas, you mentioned criteria. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, one to four million of EBITDA for their discovery fund is a pretty small platform company. Most companies will tell you you got to be over five million if you want to be a platform. So what Trivest will say is if you're in one of the three or four industries that they like, if there's opportunity for additional acquisition, if you have high customer retention, if you have good profit margins, if you have good leadership in, you know, um, in the company, all of those type of criteria. And, and Trivest is, is very good and very clear because they have a process that works. And they've, they've documented that really well. I would say every private equity firm out there has a process and has criteria. And then private equity guys have a thesis is what they like to call it. And they'll say, hey, we want to be in digital marketing. We want to be in supply chain management. We want to be in software only, right? Whatever it might be. And so that then becomes part of their criteria for, for making investments. Mm. I'm curious, numbers wise, what else? Like, if an agency is listening right now, they may be something they put on their their just their roadmap. It's like, here's what we need. If we want to get acquired one day, you can reverse engineer this. It's not a surprise. Like, we, like you said, all these companies have a criteria. You can go, okay, we need to hit these benchmarks to, and then we could approach these people. So I love to hear that if yeah. an agency is listening, go, okay, let, I want to reverse engineer. I want to know these numbers so that I can approach Todd and go, hey, I'm hitting these. What should we do now? Right. So let me give you a couple of examples. You, you should know where you think the puck is going. Um, and I would amend that statement a little bit. It kind of doesn't matter where you think the puck is going. If the marketplace is moving in a certain direction and investors are moving and, and they believe that's the future, I, I, you could fight uphill if you want to. That just is, is a more difficult fight. However, so as you know, most of the clients we work with are between a million of EBITDA and four million of EBITDA. Uh, we did a transaction earlier in the year worth e-commerce. And Dean, if you want to hear the story, Dean is on at secondbitepodcast.com. Dean uh, you know, shared very generously about what his experience was like. But Dean was a little bit less than a, a million dollars of EBITDA. But Dean was really focused in their offering. They did e-commerce customers only, and they did email marketing. Really nice little box. We put a nice bow on it. And then we could show it around to people, right? They understood what that meant. And they knew that if I want that piece, then I get a pure play in that, and that's great. I have an agency right now that does email marketing on the Clavio platform, also small. They're also offshore, right? They're in, in uh, Singapore, as a matter of fact. I had a conversation yesterday with a pretty good sized private equity group owned company. And we were talking, and I, I do these calls all the time, talking about, hey, so what are you trying to do? We, we need, because they just closed on a transaction. What we didn't get in that transaction is the SEO capability we need. So we're still looking for that. We definitely need more capability around Marketo and we need e- email capability set. I said, what kind of, you know, do you have a platform? He's like, yeah, you know, Marketo's a real leader there. I'm like, well, I, I got a group, like 40-something. They're offshore, great pro- great margins, great leadership, just small. He's like, I don't care how big they are. I can't find talent like that. I'm very interested in those guys. So even to your point, we talked to a lot of guys well before they're ready to execute on a transaction, if timing was completely up to them, sometimes the market will dictate timing, at least in opportunities, that I think entrepreneurs should want to at least be aware of, right? So it's numbers. It's also space. Like Obviously, e-commerce is hot right now. Um, so email marketing in e-commerce is obviously hot. Um, and any other numbers-wise people should be thinking about whether it's 
um, mar- you mentioned margins, whether it's staff count, um, or is it just the, the EBITDA that is really the main? EBITDA is a big one. Recurring revenue is very big. Client retention, very big. Or, or revenue retention, right? And the question is, if we buy the company, what are we going to get? Is the revenue going to continue? Are the clients going to stay, right, on and on from there? And then the other thing to keep in mind is it is a dynamic marketplace. So, you know, as it was in the press, Worth Ecommerce was acquired by Smartbug. Smartbug's not going to acquire another Clavio partner. They've got a great one. So they're off the board is what we would say. So as more and more people acquire businesses or or opportunities that they like, they they typically will grow, once they have the capability set, they'll grow that out across their customer base. So, so that opportunity is off the board for future, right? And if private equity is acquiring and they have something, then perhaps, and while those windows close, windows over here open. So it's, it's very dynamic from that perspective. That buyer, their criteria might be a little bit different than this, what this buyer. Todd, you mentioned something interesting because I know in the, conversations I've had with agency owners, they're all, there's a constant conversation about niching. And when you talked about worth e-commerce specifically, we're talking niche space and niche service. How important is um, when you're talking to agencies, if they're asking for advice on, should I niche? Should I not? Niche could mean service. It could mean space. What are your thoughts on on that piece. That's a great question. Two thoughts. One is it gives you an opportunity to exit when you're smaller, I think, because it's a, it's a clear story. You can also have a really clear story without being in a niche. But if you can identify what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it, right? And who you're doing it for. And so I'm working with a client right now. They do outsource sales management. And they would say, if you do a transaction, we're not right for you. If you acquire customers and they're repeat buyers, that's the market we serve. That's the people we target. And so as long as you can articulate your story really well, I think you can, you know, you can make good business decisions as you always should, not specifically focus on, hey, is this how are we going to exit or is this going to allow us to exit a year earlier or what have you? Yeah. The reason I ask is it sounds like some of the private equity companies you're talking to, they have a specific, some kind of service in mind. Like we need SEO capability or we need this capability. And yeah. it makes it easier if a company does a bunch of stuff to say, well, this is really what they're looking for. I don't know if that's typically the case or is that an outlier? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. I have a deal that should close in the middle of December. And we're middle of uh, November. It's a larger global group. They need SEO capability. So we had a client, did about 2 million of EBITDA, does SEO only. And they were thrilled with that. They have other capability sets. So they didn't want a digital marketing firm. They didn't want somebody that does pay-per-click and social and content and everything else. Just SEO. Not as valuable to them. They just want the SEO. Right. Now, there's plenty of people. Here's the interesting thing, because it was very interesting to me, because I've worked with this client for a long time, over a year. And COVID got in the middle of it and some other stuff happened. But I remember when I told them, I said, geez, man, we'll sell this thing. You know, We'll do a transaction for you in three or six months, no problem. And as they took that around, I had a lot of what I thought would be really good buyers say, so they only do SEO. And it's $2 million. Eh, you know, $2 million doesn't move the needle a ton. We're already kind of, we're already doing SEO, right? Because it's a core holding to, you know, digital marketing. So I didn't get nearly the reaction that, that I thought we would. Hmm. But we kept at it, we kept at it, we kept at it. And we finally found, you know, you, as you go through the process, you learn what the market's telling you and you react to that. Hmm. I love it. So earn out. What are yeah. some of the things you hear founders say about earnout? You know, I don't know why it gets such a bad rap. Um, I think it gets a bad rap because people don't do it well or do it right. But the thing most people hear, and maybe it's just more popular to put in magazines and tell stories about, is you should never count on your earnout. 
right? You're not going to get it, whatever the case may be. So, uh, so I will say, you know, in almost all of these, our clients get 100% of their earnings or a, an enormous chunk of it. And so there's a couple of things, and I'll give you an example. And I jotted some notes down so I, I, I could articulate well. Um, so let's just assume we have a business, 2 million of EBITDA, and there's a million dollars of earn out. We'll keep the number simple, right? There's a million dollars of earn out for two years. And we've told the buyer we're going to grow at 20%. So if I could make one really strong statement to everybody listening, you will not get paid for future growth when you sell your agency. You say we're going to grow at 20%. You say you're going to grow at 30%. You say you're going to grow at 40%. It doesn't make the company any more valuable. What it does do is raise the bar on how high you have to jump to get your earn out. Mistake number one. I, I've got three, three projects we're working on now. Company, one company in particular growing at 35% a year for the last three years through COVID. You know what our projection is for 22? 20%. And of course, the buyers ask, how come you're only 20% next year? You know, my clients say every single time, I always project 20%. That's all we always. And then we try to outperform it. So now our hurdle rate in the future is 20% because that's what we said. Right? Anyways, if they want, so then if they demand 30%, then they have to pay more for the business, right? There's, this is all negotiation. You lay the groundwork for winning negotiation weeks and weeks in advance, right? Anyways, 2 million of EBITDA growing at 20%. So in the first year of earnout, you got to get the 2.4 million to get your earnout. Okay? So we always do that on a sliding scale. And this is what I mean by that. You start to get earnout at 2 million of EBITDA, what you did last year. So between 2 million and 2.4 million, this is 400,000. That 400,000, if you do that, you'll get the million dollars. So think of it this way. For every dollar over 2 million, you get two and a half dollars, right? So if you do 2.1 million, which would be a huge miss, you're still going to get $250,000, right? If you do, and here's the big one though, if you do $2.37 million, you don't miss because you didn't do 2.4. You get almost all of that earnout. So you just take 370 in that. Experience. It's not an all or nothing. People think it's an all or nothing. Right. That That's number one. Number two is, let's say we did 3.7 or 2.370. The amount of earnout we didn't get, we put in the pile for next year. So we can still earn. We haven't lost it forever. If we do 2.5 million in year number one, we want that to start for next year. So next year, we don't start at zero. We start at 100,000. And there's a bunch of reasons and, and talk track around why that makes sense, really, for the buyer as much as for the seller, right? So that's the stuff that is as a basic setup structure for earnout. Most buyers that are experienced have seen something very similar to this. The numbers could alter a little bit, right? They might, you might, you could try to argue that at, we want to start the earnout at 1.8. The buyer typically says, if you go backwards in EBITDA, I'm not going to pay you part of your earnout. I way overpaid in terms of cash at close. Now it depends. If the cash at close is low, you can say, shit, you haven't paid me anything cash at close, right? So I want, I want the lower hurdle, and this is all. Part of this shifting of uh, a negotiation give and take, right? So, like, kind of goes back to the question of how should someone structure their earnout? Yeah. So, number one, so this, so two things. Number one, we want as much cash up front at close as possible. That's easy. Number two, maybe you just take equity. Right? The buyer wants you committed to the long-term success of the business, typically. Equity will do that. So you could, you could take on $2 million, say that agency trades at seven times EBITDA because it's got great 
recurring revenue and retention, everything else, it's $14 million. Maybe you get 8 million cash at close. Maybe you get 4 million in equity. Maybe you get 2 million in an earn. And we would structure it like that. Maybe you don't want as much equity. You want more earn out. Maybe you really love the company. Maybe you don't love the company as much, but those guys are paying you 14 million and the next best buyer was only going to pay you 12 and a half. Right. So you, you compare all those things and try to come up with a good decision. You mentioned Todd mistakes, right? One mistake is people say, well, we're going to be growing, you know, a lot faster. We're going to be growing at 30%, 40%. And they think that's going to increase the value, but just seems to make it tougher for the earnout piece. Right. What other mistakes do people make? You know, kind of when you've done this a bunch of times, I, you start to realize the back and forth. We're going to say this. They're going to say this. They're going to shift here. We're going to shift here. If you go into it not knowing the first three or four or five moves, right, just like playing chess or checkers with a, a, you know, a champion, you should know when you sit down with that guy what his first three moves are going to be, right? You should know, like every NFL and college team, your scripted first 10 plays. If you don't know that going into negotiations, you are behind the eight ball from that standpoint. So number one is not really having a strategy. Number two is not really having an awareness of the market or, or maybe two competitive buyers or three or four, right? Because that's what help, you know, drives valuation. So I want to shift from earnout to the kind of the question about the what order you're purchased. When you're talking about private equity, you could be the first acquisition, you could be the last acquisition, because this kind of falls into the whole conversation around second bite. Yes. And so I'd love great. for you to talk about the advantages, disadvantages of kind of where someone's at when they are negotiating sure. with a private equity firm. So when private equity buys a company, they typically expect that on their money, they're going to get five times on their money. Right. So if they invest at a business, put $10 million in, they expect that they're going to be able to take out $50 million at some point in the future. Right. So they're really committed to growing the business. Maybe it'll wind up being 3X. Maybe it'll wind up being 10X. Somewhere between three and five or six times is what they're shooting for. So if you're that platform company, you're going to get most of that upside with your partner. And we've got, you know, in these over my shoulder, some pretty good examples of that actually happening. When you say platform company. So platform company that? means that's the first acquisition. So we want to be a HubSpot partner, which SmartBug was for American Discovery Capital. American Coveries Discovery Capital said, we're going with SmartBug. This is our platform. We're going to build on top of it. And so that's what they've begun to do, right? Um, on and on. The people at Everlane said, um, uh, with one of their earlier purchases, I'm forgetting about that. That's going to be our platform. And a couple of things we're working on now, exact same thing. We're going to start in this space and we're going to grow out from it. Those guys typically get kind of, let's call it partnership status with the private equity group. They get more upside. They get a little bit better valuation. They get all those kind of things. So then if you are the first acquisition, there's not typically, there's not a lot of growth from the platform acquisition to tuck in number one. It might be a matter of two or three or four months. Probably, this is part of the private equity playbook, right? We're going to buy and build a good company. And so what a lot of companies will do is not, people use this term roll up, right? So we got a HubSpot agency. Let's just keep rolling up HubSpot agency. People don't do that as much anymore. What they have done at, at American Discovery Capital is said, hey, we're going to be in HubSpot, we're going to be in Klaviyo, we're going to be in this, and we're going to be in this, and we're going to create this arc of services, right? Tenuity did this very well before they exited to New Mountain Capital. A lot of companies have done this well. So, so if you can be that first tuck-in a couple months later, you're going to get most of that growth that the platform company had, right? Most of it. But you're also going to be in for the full ride. That full ride you should expect is going to be five years, plus or minus a year or so, right? If 
we've got a company now that hopefully we're working on a transaction with. They're large enough now that they will probably exit in 23. So that'd be 18 months. That's what their game plan is going to be. So if we do a transaction with them and we get equity and we get the rest, probably my guys will be out of it within two years. Maybe longer, but probably. But they're not going to get three times on their money, most likely. Right? So, so that's a, a big consideration in terms of what it is that you want to do, right? So, for example, and, and this is the way we work, somebody comes and says, hey, this is what I want to do. And let, for example, we go to TriVest and TriVest says, for whatever reason, we, we don't invest in that vertical. We don't, you know, this doesn't hit all of our criteria. Because that discovery fund will we'll do a platform investment with a one to four million dollar EBITDA business, right? And then give you all the support around that, which is the, one of the great things about private equity. If not, and so if they won't, for example, and others may or may not, then perhaps we become the first tuck in somewhere else. And then you, you get the accretion on, on the way that that works. I could see that if you're the first acquisition, you have a bigger upside, because but you're also in for a longer journey. And the opposite could be is true if you're, you know, towards the end of their journey of making acquisition and selling. Correct. Could also the 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 one that's gonna exit in 12 to 18 months, they kind of they they know what they're gonna do. They've kind of done most of what they're gonna do. The earlier guys say, hey, here's our path forward. But the path is like this. I don't, I'm not sure if the opportunity will take us this direction or that direction. So you got to be more nimble. You got to be more comfortable with change. You got to be more comfortable with, hey, I thought we were doing this. Like, yeah, but this is the opportunity for us. So that's what we're doing. Right. So you're kind of on for the ride, although you're a really important contributor to the overall success of, of that of that company. Yeah. So when you're helping these companies vet deals, that's a consideration that you're looking at. What, what order are they in, in the, in the acquisition order of that particular company? Yeah, that's, that it's important, right? Mm -hmm. The, this is part of what the, our discovery when we, you know, bring on a client or start to work with a client. And the other thing I've, I've learned is you guys don't really know. They have an opinion, right? I think I want to do this. I think I want to do that. But until you actually start to talk to the private equity partners, the, the, the companies they've already acquired and those executives and see what their management style is, their growth plan is, their view of the future is, their plans for world domination. These are the things that you need to understand. And, and it's funny because if you do that enough, four, five, six in, you know, meetings like that, you start to form real opinions around, you know, I never thought I'd want to stay on board for four or five years. But God, these guys in their plan and the ability to cross sell into their customer base and everything else, geez, that's just going to be a home. It's going to be a ton of fun for us. I wanted to talk about, I've heard this term, you say it before also, waterfall. Yeah. Waterfall is big. And again, I jot a couple notes because it's really, really important. People talk about it, it kind of share class, right? Preferred shares versus non-preferred shares. So I'll give you a little bit of an insight there. So let's assume we've got a business and private equity bought into the platform company and they put in $10 million, okay? They're getting out 10 million first, okay? So they put in 10, they bought the company. And in the theory is the company got to take that 10 million bucks. So they've already gotten theirs. Private equity should get theirs. Private equity today typically gets a preference on their money, which is an 8% yield. That 8% will be paid at exit. Could be six, could be not many that are trying to get away with more than that. But let's say it's 8%. And let's just say we sell the business five years later, we being the private equity group. And so let's use an example where private equity bought company number one, and then they bought us as the first company. So private equity is going to get their 10 million back out of the sale price. And let's do this. Let's say they sold the business for $50 million. When we did our deal, again, I'm just making up hypotheticals. We did our deal. We got cash at close. We got that 
earnout I was telling you about, the million and a million, so $2 million earnout, and we got 5% of the new company, right? 5% of the new company, quick math on that is they sold it for 5 million bucks. We have 5%. So what do we get? I mean, 50 million. I'm sorry. Yeah, they sold for 50 million. We have 5% of that. So what do we get? Well, eh, you want me to say two and a half million, but it's probably yes. not right. Yeah. Right. So let's go to the waterfall. So now private equity gets their 10 back, right? Yeah. Private equity also is owed 8% a year for five years. That's 4 million. So private equity is going to get 14. So that leaves 36. We get 5% of 36. 1.8. So the first platform company was 10 million. This, this tuck in company, do you have to factor in what that was purchased for too? Because yes, the 36. That all gets, so I'm, I'm really oversimplifying because okay. so we can comp comprehend it. But Got here's it. the important point private equity gets theirs, it's 36 million left over. We get 5% of 36 is 1.8. So the question is is that the way the waterfall works? Private equity first, then it just waterfalls to everybody else. Well, so the, the platform company that we bought, they, again, making it up, they rolled forward $6 million. We told them they're in line right after us for their sales. Okay. So 14 to private equity, six to those guys, the first tuck, and, and then us. So now we get 5%, $30 million. It's a million, not a million eight, a million five, 300 grand left. So now, and again, really critical language, all right? So what if we have language in there? And I'm, again, I'm making up numbers, but when we rolled in to get the 5%, it was $3 million. Let's say it's $2 million worth, okay? So if private equity gets their money and then the, platform company got their six million dollars we should get our two million that we rolled in okay let's say we do that's 14 six that's 20 plus 22 our so we get our two so so now the leftover is 28 million dollars right we get five percent of 28 because it all waterfalls into the right to the pool we get five percent it's 1.4 on top of our two so we get 3.4 out of it. So private equity gets theirs as a preference, which is always, so don't even negotiate that. They always get it. You say, thank you very much, right? If the platform company has a preference on their shares, we want a preference too. We want to get our 2 million bucks out. First, here's what becomes really important. What if they sold the company? So, so we sold, um, again, I'm making these numbers up. We got five or six million cash at close. We got that earn out. We got $2 million of equity. We didn't take his cash. We took his equity. If they sell this business for $30 million and we don't have a preference on our two, private equity is still getting their 14 and the other guy's still getting his six. There's 10 million left over and we're getting 5% of 10 million. We're getting a half a million bucks worth. We're not even getting the two million bucks we were owed from the deal, right? This is where people lose their mind and like, oh, I got screwed on my earn. You just need to have an experienced banker, an experienced lawyer, somebody that knows the waterfall piece to it. Because if you're doing, if you are going into this game with a guy that's got his first ten step scripted or a chess master, and you're like, yeah, I, you know, I like the guys. I think they're going to treat us well. Good luck. Right. This is I mean, this is real money. People fight over this stuff. So you just got to know what you're doing. So as you see there, the waterfall and the preference piece is a difference between getting three point four million dollars. Or one point eight million dollars on a fifty million dollar sale. That's a big chunk of money. Uh, this has been great. I'm going to have to re-listen to this. There's a lot. To, there's a lot there. Secondbitepodcast.com. You can listen to this off. Secondbitepodcast.com. <laughs> check it out. If you have questions, go to PotomacBusinessCapital.com, and you could also check out TriVest. It will all be in the notes. And uh, thanks, Todd. Jeremy, it was really great having you. Thanks. 
Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.